And when we say suffering from mental health, health issues, there was a really wide spectrum of, of, of those issues in amongst the people that we spoke to from people who perhaps wouldn't describe themselves as having um, any sort of mental health issues, but were very living very stressful and chaotic lives through to people who were, you know, um, uh, engaging with 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 professionals to help them with their their mental health. So we can't silo people and it's very difficult to talk about people in social housing, for example, because those people in social housing are also lots of other different things as well. People are multifaceted. Um, and this interconnection of these factors that we were focusing on compounds the disadvantage um, that these people suffer. Across all of that, mental health issues are a very dominant thread um, amongst these communities. And as I say, ranging from everyday stresses, particularly provoked by the pandemic, provoked by the cost of living crisis, uh, just day to day feeding the family issues, things like that. Um, to severe mental health issues and illnesses. And, and we saw um, and spoke to people for whom those had come out quite significantly um, as a result of, of the pandemic. And mental health is, is such a key issue um, for smokers because it um, is, is a, a reason to smoke. And I'll talk a bit more about that, that in a minute. It, it's one of the things that um, they smoke to help them with themselves with, but it's also a significant barrier to, to quitting smoking. Looking at um, people who live in coastal towns, I've just pulled those out because they didn't seem to differ at all from um, people from deprived communities in, in other areas. Um, they, they're often very fond of where they live. They're quite proud of that where they live. Um, um, a lot of the people we spoke to, we spoke to people in coastal towns on the south coast, but also we went up to Blackpool. Um, a lot of those people were living in social housing. Some were in privately rented accommodation. Um, many were um, living in poverty and, and certainly nearly all of those that the smokers that we spoke to were struggling financially. Um, many suffer with mental health issues um, of varying severity. Um, and the younger people that we spoke to because they lived in coastal towns were obviously oft, often those needs, not in education, not in employment, not, not in training. So we didn't feel that being a, a coastal location smoker made them any different to all, all of the other smokers that we had. And um, there's a quote there from a, a really lovely lady in, in Blackpool. I was a single mum of six, um, relying on charities, food banks, um, really, um, really struggling to keep her family fed and housed, all those sorts of things. She lived in social housing um, and she said, I've got six kids. I don't care. I'm happy to be a smoker. It's my only outlet. I don't go out. I don't do anything else. I'm quite happy to be a smoker. So you can see just just a, just an example of someone there who was so multifaceted. So if we move on to quitting and just um, put some context around the smoking, most of the people that we spoke to in, in our research had been smoking since they were teenagers. There was very few that had started um, any later than their, their late teens. Um, and uh, the attitudes to their own smoking reflect what we see generally across all, all types of smokers. Um, it's quite a volatile um, relationship they have with smoking. It's a love-hate relationship. Um, you know, they love the feeling that the cigarette gives me, but they hate the fact that they're addicted to it. They hate the fact that they feel ruled by their smoking. Um, they they have the enjoyment, but the guilt and, and those those emotions really um, can fluctuate from from moment to moment, from day to day, from week to week. Um, so it's it's a very it is a very volatile relationship that they have with their own smoking um, and most wish they'd never started. That said, um, although they wished that they weren't smokers, um, we found in this research there was a notable lack of drive to quit or even inclination to quit. So they could say they wished they didn't smoke, but they, they weren't wishing um, themselves into a, a quitting moment, if you like. Um, and these people are very contextualised by smoking. It's, it's the norm for many of them. It's all around them. And they see smoking as an essential tool for dealing with life. Um, they can't imagine coping without it. They're often not interested in, in trying to cope 
um, uh, without it. So here's a quote. It's just my mental health at the moment. It's a lonely place to be. And when you get lonely, it gets stressful for you. When you get stressed, you just have a fag and it takes the stress away. It's just me and my baby. I moved down here on my own. I'm on my own. That's why I smoke, really. So there's that mental health issue coming in. So it gives her the, 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 the relief from the stress. Um, uh, that she well she she perceives that it gives her the release from the, the the stress. So looking at quitting in mental health, um, barriers to quitting are very much dominated by mental health concerns. There are other barriers to quitting, but people feel that smoke acti actively, like this lady just said in the quote, relieves the stress, relieves the tension. It gives you that that moment. Um, it diffuses the the tense situation. It can diffuse um, volatile mood situations of so anger. Um, they can take things to calm. They take a cigarette to, to, to calm them down. It gives people space. It gives them time out, me time. So lots of people talking about, especially when the pandemic hit, the kids were at home, just to take the cigarette outside and stand in the garden and just have some me time. Kids are all in the house. I'm out here. <sighs> I can chill and just that 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 space. And that's also something we see with people who work. They take a, the, the cigarette break to, to give them time out from from working. Um, it does relieve isolation because you can go out and stand outside with lots of smokers. Um, it relieves boredom. So we saw lots of people talking in the pandemic that 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 helped them. Um, cigarette um, and cigarettes uh, consumption increased because uh, they were bored. Um, a strong sense amongst these people that life is difficult and clearly they do lead, live difficult lives, but that quitting just adds to that difficulty. It adds more anxiety. It adds more stress. Um, and at the same time, it's adding stress and adding anxiety and it's taking away the very thing that they feel helps them deal with that stress and anxiety. So it's like a double whammy there. It takes away their coping mechanism, but also removes a key pleasure. And for many who say, um, you know, it's the only pleasure I have. I don't. It's the only vice I have. Um, most of the smokers we talk to, um, if, if you have the discussion about um, quitting smoking, helping with mental health, they 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 find that impossible um, to believe. Um, and then that, that's true for people with significant mental health issues, but also for, also for those who um, might not see themselves as have mental having mental health issues per se, but rely on smoking to cope with the day to day stresses. So so very much um, in, embedded in, in that cycle of, you know, I need my cigarettes to quit. Um, I need my cigarettes to cope and actually quitting would make me cope less and I wouldn't have the very thing that, that helps me uh, to cope. Other barriers to quitting, uh, people talk about weight gain, worry about drinking more, worry about social exclusion, for example, people who um, do um, engage with other smokers and that might be um, a, a key part of their social uh, interaction with other people. Um, some smokers fear failure, they worry about how they will feel if they don't succeed. And, and others talk about, um, I don't want to live a life of always wanting something that I can't have. They don't feel that that craving um, will ever go away. And that's obviously not something to particularly look forward to. Some smokers, particularly older smokers, um, more entrenched smokers are quite defeatist about things. You know, it's just impossible to quit. It's too difficult. Can't imagine that I would ever be able to quit. Um, and as I said, smoking often cited as, as the only vice for people. And a, a lot of talk about um, you have to be ready to quit. No one else can quit for me. It has to be me. I have to be in the right mindset. There's no point trying till I'm in that mindset and I'm not in that mindset at the moment. Um, and we talked in the last session about, you know, they, they find it re really difficult to understand or predict how they can get themselves at that moment when they're ready. Um, and, and therefore they say, you know, well, I, I can't quit yet because, you know, I'm just not at that moment. Um, and they they don't have a propensity to long term thinking or long term planning. They leave quite chaotic lives, um, have the day to day struggles and, and, and aren't really planning. And that was quite evident in lots of areas, including people sort of saying, well, I know the cost of living crisis is, is bearing in mind we did this earlier this year is on the horizon, but, you know, I'm, I'm just putting my head in the sand about it at the moment. 
just reflecting a little bit on those younger smokers who are not in education, employment or training. Um, a very interesting group typically started smoking when they were quite young um, and they are still quite young, but just don't have the drive or urgency to quit. It's not a priority. It's not necessarily something they even think about. Um, quite a few talked about actively not wanting to quit, that they enjoyed smoking um, and uh, compared to older smokers are quite unworried about their smoking. Um, they're very naive. They feel that they will just give up when the moment comes. That moment might be when they turn 30. It might be when they um, start thinking about having children or possibly become pregnant. Um, and, and they speak about it if it's just something that they'll do and don't have a recognition of how difficult it's going to be for them when they actually get to that point. In terms of methods of quitting, um, most of the people that we spoke to who attempted to quit had just gone cold turkey and um, a, a fairly significant contingent saying that's the only way to go. It's got to be you. Um, you need a lot of willpower to do it. And here we go again. You have to be ready. Um, people not necessarily thinking about engaging with anybody else um, to help them quit. <laughs> there was a big discussion about cutting down on an obvious route. And a lot of people sort of um, learn from a, a cold turkey attempt and say, OK, well, that didn't work for me. So maybe it's a case of, you know, I'm on 15 at the moment a day, roughly. I'll go down to 12, then I'll go down to 10 and I'll go down to eight. And, and um, that feels like a fairly obvious route. Um, and they do perceive that um, smoking less is better for them than smoking more. Um, it's cutting down is, is a much more achievable goal. Um, it's linked very strongly to vaping. Lots of discussion about vaping and using a vape as a, a or an e-cigarette as, as a way to, to, to come off cigarettes per se. And that, um, you know, you then get into the dual situation where they're smoking fewer cigarettes and using a vape to, to substitute those. Cutting down also seen as easier on mental health than an abrupt stop, um, but a recognition that it's very easy for the numbers to creep back up. You need to be very disciplined about it. Roly smokers saying it's it's harder to to, um, to to use cutting back because you don't necessarily um, have an obvious measure of how many cigarettes you're smoking. If you've got a packet of cigarettes, you can see that there were 20 and now there's 10. It's not like that for Rollies. And for some people, um, they reject the idea of cutting down as a route to quitting. That it's, it has to be all or nothing. And they liken it to an alcoholic They're saying an alcoholic can't have one drink. You know, it's 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 all or nothing. And they're saying, you know, you can't even have one cigarette. Um, in that route. Um, just going back to, to, to vaping, um, many have tried to vape either to quit um, smoking fully or to reduce the amount that they smoke. And we came across a range of ex experiences and perceptions. Um, interestingly, all the people who we spoke to who were classified as living below the poverty line had tried vaping um, and, as a drive to save money. But not all of our respondents see vaping as, as a cheaper option. And um, there's a lot of uh, lot of discussion about the, 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 the range of choice, getting the right vape for you, the pre-planning that you have to have to make sure it's charged, to make sure you've got the refills, all of those things. You know, people can can put up lots of barriers to vaping. But at the same time, we, we did have some um, some some fairly um, significant uh, success stories from, from vaping as well. Mixed, ex in ex mixed experience of nicotine replacement therapies um, and everybody has a story to tell, whether it's their story or an anecdote that they've heard. Um, uh, some people feel that um, it used to be that you could get um, NRT uh, free over the counter from you, um, either from your GP or from the pharmacist, but that doesn't exist anymore. So it's not a cheaper way. It's not a way to save money if, if that's your driver to, to cut back. Um, and uh, it, there's a cost to it and therefore it's it's prohibitive. In terms of attitudes to seeking help, um, most of the people we spoke to quitting wasn't an imminent sort of issue for them. They weren't um, necessarily on the on the brink of, of trying a quit attempt and looking for help was not top of mind. Um, some do the, reject the idea. If you say, I'll oh, have you thought about, um, you know, a, a, a quit smoking service, something like that. 
so it's not for them um, lots of reasons why it's not for them but many of them are unaware of um, well unaware that the service is available very much unaware of what those services might be um, a lack of understanding of what the offer is you know there's very much a perception that you have to go and sit in a, like an AA meeting type setting and um, and talk in, in, in that sort of context, that sort of forum. Um, and they don't understand um, the benefits to them of, of seeking quitting, uh, seeking help when quitting. Um, in social housing, we touched on the idea of smoking cessation services um, provided through the landlord. And um, that wasn't something that that went down particularly well. Um, they don't necessarily see a role for the landlord in supporting quitting. And there's often a sense of hostility and this defensive um, barrier comes up. Um, they have a fear for smoke free tenancies being imposed and people start talking about, you know, this is my home. People can't tell me what to do in my home. So when communicating these things, you know, it, it requires very very clear communication you know to say that you're not talking about necessarily um stopping you smoking in in home um and uh, you know one smoker said it would be my last port of call and very much a feeling that people don't understand what the role could be and they would just be suspect of suspecting of it um as i said notable numbers have an attitude that it's all down to me personally to quit it's about willpower determination and if you haven't got that no support in the world will make any difference. Um, at the same time, they do recognise that being alone in the quit is hard and that peer support would be helpful and welcome. We had discussions because we did this focus groups online. We had discussions that actually a, a forum like this might work for some people where you were online talking to people who were going through the same things. So recognition that support from peers going through it is, is, is a useful, a useful tool. So just to summarise those points, then um, this this first point that I made about we can't look at people as being, you know, social housing um, uh, residents or mental health sufferers. There, there's so many things and so many factors come into play and um, that compounded disadvantage from from all of those things uh, being present for some people. Mental health, um, uh, a, a real thread throughout the smoking discussion on why people smoke and why they won't quit and why they lapse as well. Um, these people have very chaotic lives, um, long term thinking, long term planning, including thinking about quitting isn't really um, something that they that we see a lot of. Amongst, certainly amongst the smokers that we talk to in this 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 uh, work. Um, smoking is seen as an, an essential um, everyday tool for just getting through life, um, for coping um, with stresses and strains of life and often seen as an only vice and justify, you know, I don't drink. And so, you know, you know, you can't give up everything you love in life. Um, there was a perceived lack of um, drive to quit, um, despite these people not wanting to be smokers, it didn't necessarily translate in a, a drive um, to quit. Um, the removal of the support that smoking gives them with their mental health is, um, is a significant um, barrier to quitting. And a perception amongst many that you can only do it for yourself um, and a very much a lack of awareness of what support might be available um, what format um, that that support might come in, where you would access it, what the cost of accessing it would be and why they might use it, what the benefits for using it uh, might be. And that's my presentation, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thanks very much, Sonia. I'm going to hand over now to um, Francis Thurway, who's um, an anthropologist and sociologist at York with a specific interest in smoking and health inequalities to give her um, expert response. So, Francis, over to you. We can't hear you, Francis. Time. OK, can you hear me now? Yep. Yes. Yep. Brilliant. Yes. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for inviting me. Uh, I'm not going to be using any slides, so I'll just talk you through some points. Um, that was a very interesting presentation, but at the same time, um, I'm sure other people will probably feel like me, somewhat 
depressed because we have the, the same issues that we've had for such a long time and I don't think much of that was very surprising um, but obviously there's other things we want to address but it, it, it did remind me very much of Hilary Graham's uh, groundbreaking research um, in going back to the 80s with um, young mums who were smoking and it's kind of the same sort of issues so yes we need to do more to address these so what can I, I say that would be what can I tell you that would be helpful so um, my research is all with smokers and quitters and vapors and it's all on basically smoking cessation and how people people quit, why they don't quit, um, whether they then switch to vaping, whether they don't, whether that helps. So um, and I've done my research mainly in the northeast of England, but also more recently, a lot of time in the northwest in Manchester. And, um, and then again, uh, more recently, I've started doing a lot of research in South Wales and in Scotland and Fife um, so, and in London. So that was a new one for me. Yes. Yeah, so um, I'll just talk through some of the things that came out of the of the presentation that I was struck by. So I'll start with the um, the kind of first few slides about the characteristics. And I think the the, the key point about intersecting issues that um, was the first point made is that um, people might have mental health problems, but they might also live in social housing. They might also be young mum. You know, they're not they're not one thing. They're well, we're all. Diff many different things and I think I think we know that but I think the key point about that is is for me is that we need to uh, work out the best way of of, uh, of uh, working with people where they are um, and so which of the characteristics is the one that can where we can actually meet people so um, so for me that that's where the world of social housing is really important because um, I've done a lot of work kind of mapping areas I've done research in and um, and it was always very clear that the if I wanted to meet smokers I, I, I just worked out where the um, generally social housing estates were and also but also where the private rented sector was um, not I mean, with a few exceptions like the student renting and that sort of thing but generally the private rented sector was also where uh, a lot of deprivation and that's kind of very, very obvious if you look at you know, in your own areas I'm sure so I just think that uh, social housing and and, uh, and uh, particularly how social housing because private rented housing is actually more difficult to reach people and as much as there isn't a kind of you know there isn't a, a landlord available that you can work with so that's a key thing for me um, I was I was Kind of pleased to see that you found well pleased is perhaps a long word that coastal communities were no different because personally i find that the the kind of talk about coastal communities having some kind of separate profile i've had I, I can't see that that makes any sense um it's the same issues as everywhere um and then the the uh, the other thing is that when people were talking about their um about smoking and, and uh, tobacco as a tool to cope i think they talked about um you said something about loneliness and i think that's that's really really important is that um pe people who are who are smoking often it's 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 something that if they if they're isolated it's particularly difficult to, to quit and, and i was struck when i was looking through the um the data on smoking cessation um statistics and that kind of thing is just how how rare group quitting seems to be, um, even though it has the all the evidence um, in the research is that group quitting has probably got a better uh, success record than individual quitting. So I just you know put that out there because I think it'd be interesting one to discuss why we don't do more on that. Um, I'll move on to um, the the section of the presentation on barriers um, and. Um, and how people see uh, smoking as, as kind of helping mental health and stuff. And I think that's you know, it's interesting. We'll go on because we know from the science that it, it's, it, it doesn't basically. And it's obviously you get a relief from the immediate craving, the craving which was created by the fact that you're addicted to smoking. So it's kind of a cyclical thing. And we, we all know that. But but I think it's, it's kind of more than that. Cause I think it's it, it's a it's sort of intergenerational thing where if you've always seen your mum reach for cigarettes when she was stressed, then it's more than just you feeling that that helps but it's also that that's always been seen as the coping mechanism all around you and your family and friends so I think that's kind of an important cultural thing um, and the other thing that social exclusion was mentioned I think that's again that's a really important one and I've, I've written about this about how um, based on my interview data on how quitting smoking was was seen as pretentious as kind of um, distancing yourself from people in your community so that 
you know, if you stop smoking, it's because you thought you were a bit better than other people. And there was a, a kind of resistance and resentment and also perhaps sometimes a resentment because maybe you as a smoker tried to quit and, you know, this other person has succeeded and you hadn't. So um, but but the, and this resentment would be, you know, people would kind of the person who'd quit would would be teased about it um, at work or in social situations. And maybe they'd be urged to have a cigarette to relax to relapse and oh just have one and just have one so the kind of you know that's a real problem if you're surrounded by smokers a but also they're actually actively trying to stop you quitting or kind of having a go when you do that's actually a real issue um so so again um uh, it goes back to my point about group quitting i think that our focus on individual quit is problematic because smoking is not a an individual behaviour. Um, and in the, in the um, brief for this session, um, I was um, asked particularly to draw on evidence around behaviour change. Well, I don't actually believe in behaviour change, which is a kind of a, a, in, kind of a psychology term about, you know, it's all in your individual mind. I actually believe in, in cultural behaviours and cultural consumption behaviours um, and that these things happen in groups and we have to kind of tackle them in groups and you have to tackle a kind of whole culture, if you like. So uh, where was I on the oh, barriers? Yes. So it's seen as pretentious. And so you, you know, this issue of sociality and belonging and, you know, if you belong in a community where everybody smokes um, and uh, and then the other thing that was mentioned was, was defeatism, where people felt that they they tried and failed to quit. Um, and I remember this when I first started smoking research years and years ago, that people talked about hardened smokers and how to reach hardened smokers. And, and I found that I never met any hardened smokers. I met um, depressed quitters or failed quitters because everybody, even if they said they hadn't, once once you got to know people, and I tend to, I tend to get to know people over a period of time, they would they would then tell you that oh yes they had tried and failed, you know this time another time another time, and it, it was a kind of long process. Even if they told you that they were happy smokers, uh, apart from the as 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 was said in the presentation, apart from the very young who who had this wonderful belief that they can quit later because nobody wants to be a smoker forever but they do feel oh yes well I'll, I'll quit at some later a later date so going on to methods section um you talked about quitting cold turkey and yet we know that you know that is a real problem because that's the least successful way of quitting and i think the latest smoking toolkit study ucl figures uh, suggested that uh, nearly 50% of people in England use no help, you know, get no support at all, that use no method to, other than cold turkey to quit, um, with the next biggest group being being e cigs being vaping at 38%, um, sorry, 36%. And the, the, the number was a little bit lower in Scotland, actually, but uh, and in Wales, but but still, you know, ne um, nearly 50% of people not using any help at all, which is a, an issue. Now, getting on to vaping, um, Yes, a cutting down and 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 and, uh, and vaping and dual dual smoking vaping was mentioned and in, in a kind of and yes, obviously we just cutting down your cigarettes slightly and vaping is not particularly helpful. But I I do meet and I'm sure you've all met people who um and then no, by no means all but some people who have um switch to vaping because of money or 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 cut down or to cut down on their smoking, but actually have then ended up quitting um ac sort of almost accidentally without meaning to and i think that's you know so they so they didn't think they could or would but actually they found it quite easy or or they you know they managed it anyway so that that's kind of that's good and and i think there's a good point you made there about the um all the people living below the poverty line had all raped to save money because i think that's the, the the kind of financial you know the difference in the cost of vaping and smoking is absolutely key if we do want people to switch. Um, at the moment, it, it is generally you know, it, it is a it is a significantly che cheaper to vape normally. That obviously depends on what kind of vape you use. Um, if you use disposables, then it's going to be more expensive. Um, but finance is absolutely key because so certainly I've known people who 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 did that who vaped who who switched to vaping um, to save money, um, and also some people who who um, vape, uh, they smoke when they've got some money and then they vape when they run out, um, which is interesting. And I'm kind of always hoping they switch and some of them switch for good. Some of them do, but not all of them do. Um, and then the other thing I was disappointed not to hear, maybe that wasn't in your questions, was about illicit tobacco, because I think that's really important because in terms of the, the cost of smoking, um, I always ask people what, what 
what sort of tobacco they smoke, where they get it and how much it costs them. And I don't think people realise just how cheaply you can smoke. You know, if you get a pouch of rolling tobacco for £13, um, obviously not, you know, which is either fake or, or normally um, smuggled in the northeast, um, then that could last you one to two weeks. So that's £13 for one to two weeks smoking, which is not the kind of figures that are, are, are quoted generally about, about the cost. And I think you, know, you have to be aware of that, which I'm, I'm sure you all are. Um, and then finally on uh, help, the issue about help, just to say that, um, I, I mean, I wasn't surprised that people were kind of concerned about their landlord being involved in in smoking cessation because I think I think the key issue here is that we 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 need to work with and through other services which are in constant contact with um, people um, living in disadvantage and people smoking but it's very important that it shouldn't be seen as a kind of gatekeeping issue that the person you're not talking about somebody who's a gatekeeper so for instance people are so one, one thing I found is people talking about their GP um, and telling them to stop smoking. One reason it's an issue is because the GP um, is often a gatekeeper to further services or referrals or sick notes or whatever. So the, the GP has power over you and therefore, you know, them telling you to stop smoking can easily be seen as or become um, or actually become a sort of barrier. So, you know, it, we're not supposed to have the kind of you can't have your operation until you stop smoking. But that does happen. I've heard a lot of people say that. Um, and that's not what we want is that you're being services being withheld to people if they don't stop smoking. And I think that there's a concern that if it's your landlord and they obviously do have power over you, you know, that, that, that you know, it, it can be understood as, oh, well, if you don't stop smoking, then this will happen to you. So so the, it's very important that, that the services, that if services are involved with smoking cessation, that it's services that are giving people something extra, um, so but are not, are not directly tied to organisations which have power over them. Um, and I do think that that, um, that last point was that people said peer support would be useful. I think that's a really crucial one because um, I don't know anyone um, from Leeds or York is on the call today, but you might remember if you are that we we put together a funding application. We were hoping to test, um, work, look at, at the test interventions involving um, um, free e-cigs for people um, in living in poverty and smoking, but also um, peer support. And actually, peer support from from other from from other would be quitters, and also from successful quitters, and also from vapors. And that was something we didn't get funding from. But I think that's peer support within your own group is really helpful, and that we should do our best to kind of use group settings which exist already. So existing natural groups. So whether it's a group of young mums who get together, um, you know, meet up and have coffee or whatever, whether we can uh, kind of offer them smoking cessation as a group thing um, or whether it's wh whatever group it might be um, and work with them. I mean, it's it's um, I was in I was in South Wales recently and I was interviewing people who um, talking about intersection intersecting issues. I was interviewing people who were using a kind of drop in service for um, people with mental health issues and homelessness and, and all these issues and they, they basically these were people who had m multiple issues they all smoked so it was very very easy to find interviewees um but but uh, but they had mental health issues they had they'd just come out of prison um so, several of them and in prison they'd actually been able to stop smoking because of course prisons are all smoke free but once they came out there was no support so although they'd all switched to vaping in prison, once they came out, there was nothing um, locally for them. I better, I better stop. Uh, yes, thank Francis, you I do need to. Yep. to um, it's been fascinating, but I do think we need to move on now because we're about five minutes over. So, do you, do you have one last thing you'd like to say? Oh, you've gone silent. No, okay. Um, so now um, I'd like to hand over to Liz, and I think a lot of the um, things that have come out of this are really interesting. Um, about the need to work with people where they are, and of course, social housing being so important, but also the sensitivity that there is. And I think that sensitivity is about gatekeeping, but it's also about a sort of fear that actually um, that will engage you. And sometimes people um, resist being engaged. So I think it's a really important area and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. And um, Liz is from Clarion Futures, which is the charitable foundation working um, to support um, uh, tenants in Clarion housing. And they're looking at how smoking 
compensation can be embedded in their financial advice service um, and putting a lot of time and effort and money into this working with ash thank you thank you and thank you so much for inviting us today um i can't tell you it is so fascinating for us to be part of this our life is money guidance so we're approaching this um challenges from the perspective of the household budgets that we work on with our residents um all the things that were described by Sonia in the research are very familiar to us, not necessarily in the in the uh, situation of smoking, but in any conversations that we have with our residents, mental health challenges, the multifaceted nature of the disadvantage faced, the intractability of some problems, the challenges of changing behaviours. They apply in all the spheres of money help that we give. Um, so smoking is just one aspect, if you like, for us of budgeting, but it's one aspect that we're trying to put a clearer focus on. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll just very briefly, for those of you who may not be familiar with Clarion Housing Group, I just want to tell you a little bit about us and then I'll, it'll help you understand how we're sort of looking at these issues. So as Deborah said, we are part with the charitable foundation of Clarion Housing Group. Clarion Housing Group is the largest social landlo housing landlord in England. Uh, we have around 120,000 homes now across about 170 local authorities. And that map sort of shows you that we have a very strong representation across the east, the southeast and London, um, and then up towards Manchester, Birmingham and Manchester. Um, we Clarion Futures was set up effectively to add the added value services for our residents. We specifically work with residents who are the hardest to reach and who are most likely to be squeezed and struggling. And we very much focus on working with people at moments of change, like losing a job, moving on to universal credit, a change in benefits, whatever. Um, because we find those moments of change are when you can sometimes create some headspace to help people think about old problems differently. We're very, um, well, we attempt to be very integrated and holistic in our support. So the money part of Clarion Futures sits alongside digital inclusion support, jobs and training support, well-being support, and uh, community activities to overcome isolation and help people feel part of their communities. So when a resident is working with any part of Clarion Futures, they've got access to that much more kind of wraparound approach. So that gives you a context, if you like, to how we've come at this. It's not a blunt instrument. It's part of a, a much uh, wider, wider kind of, or we seek to have, offer a wider intervention. Uh, next slide, please. So in the money side of things, we talk literally to hundreds of residents every month. I manage a team of 20 people spread all over the country and my officers are fantastic at building trust and rapport on money quickly. Money is not easy to talk about. Money creates a lot of shame for households. Um, they feel inadequate, they feel judged, they feel compromised um, and, and it is difficult. But my team are very skilled at having those conversations and helping people find wiggle room, find movement in how they spend their money. And that right now could not be more important. You're all aware of the cost of living challenges for the residents we've working with. They've had cost of living challenges going back many, many years. Um, and the latest round with the energy prices, inflation is just um, making it a difficult situation intolerable. I'll give you a couple of stats. We we do an annual survey of around 2000 residents to get a sense of movement on certain things. In the most recent um, survey, 65% of the residents we surveyed had cut back on essential costs and that compares to 44% of the UK general population. A really, really worrying statistic, 29% of our residents aged 18 to 24, so that's our youngest householders, are going without food because they can't afford it. So put in that context, smoking becomes a conversation we have to have because if smoking is depriving a household of food, warmth, paying the rent, managing the essential bills, it's actually placing their well-being further at risk. So how we put it in our services is a really brief kind of diagram of how it works. 
if somebody enters our service, they get a good long, you know, an hour or so in their first appointment, which is a real listening exercise by one of the team. We listen really carefully to what's going on, what challenges and barriers they've experienced, and we try to work with them on, on trying to, as a first pass, get a realistic budget because it's from that which they can then work. So the resident hopefully feels very understood and very listened to. And the thing that the most frequent feedback we get is that people really appreciate the listening we give them. We're then practical. We don't start talking about behaviour change and doing things differently until we've done something in the here and now to help. So we'll work on benefit help, you know, to maximise income. The team can issue food and energy vouchers to help people ride an immediate crisis while they work with us. And we'll look at all the different ways they can reduce outgoings on social tariffs, different discounts and so on. So we try to get that budget better and, and safer, if you like. Then when we're into action planning, we go into a much more detailed budget with somebody. And it's part of the action planning when we're looking through all the parts of their budget that we're introducing now a kind of mandatory question around smoking. So the team need to ask, are, are, are you a smoker? Do you smoke? How often do you smoke? Have you thought about quitting? Have you ever tried quitting? What's it been like? So we're getting that conversation inserted into a wider budgeting conversation. If we're successful in that, what we're now doing is creating, um, we're, hope we're going to have a funded link into um, a digital support offer, which will include funding for a month, um, a substitute. So uh, somebody was talking there earlier about vaping not being seen as cheaper. We want to be able to fund, say, a trial of vaping um, for four weeks so somebody can maybe get used to the equipment, get used to a flavour that they like and see if it's something that works. Because not only do we, you know, I'm aware from from what the conversation we've had with Ash about, you know, it is 95% less harmful to vape, I understand, so it's public health England than smoking tobacco. Um, but for us on the money side of things, it could be a lot cheaper. And my colleague um, Francis was just mentioning that you might be able to get a tobacco pouch that will last you for two weeks for £13. £13 is probably 20% of somebody's disposable income for the households we're working with. So even that's a really significant part of their income that they have to manage. So I put that little diagram up just for you to see and hopefully understand a little bit about where it's located. And crucially for us, it's located within mental health and coaching support. We're not, um, we won't be coaching on the quitting. We'll give that, we we'll leave that to you as the experts but it's part of wider coaching and helping a resident feel supported in the changes they make. So next slide, slide please, Amy. So really lots and lots of the research, which is really helpful and we'll definitely be taking it back to the team to discuss further. But one of the things that I guess what I want to highlight things that stood out for me in the kind of quitting conversations, um, you know, when people say most wish they hadn't never started, but there's that lack of drive or a uh, lack of inclination to quit and that sense of the norm. So our first response to that is we're trying to make asking about smoking habits a norm in our money conversations so that we're not just brushing it to one side. We're bringing it centrally in our budgeting with people. We totally recognise the mental health challenges. Um, we are seeing a real pervasive difference in the conversations we're having with residents over the last six to nine months um quite a downward spiral so we know life is very very difficult and we do not ask people to do things which isn't in their orbit headspace to do um but what we will do is recognize and work with those mental health concerns because also those concerns will link to i can't afford to put the heating on i can't feed the kids i can't buy school uniform i can't replace shoes. So there are lots of concerns that we're trying to work with and my team are gifted at trying to talk through and listen to all those concerns. And we, we do a lot of training around motivational interviewing to help residents think about the kind of cost benefits of different approaches. Um, started to touch on this. Yeah, this idea that the research brings out that people kind of want to be ready to quit and they can say, I am not ready to change. Uh, we know definitely most of the residents we work with, their focus is in the very immediate here and now. You know, we savings conversations are really hard. Talking to people about what they might save over two, four, four weeks, six weeks. 
but the time frame isn't like that. The time frame is here and now. So we have to work with actually kind of how can we have a conversation which says, what could you try here and now? Would you like to try kind of um, this, you know, and then we'll have a link hopefully to, we're, we're actually in tender at the moment for a, a digital support app to put through, as well as telling people about their local quit smoking services. So my team would hopefully prompt people to say, what's the risks in a change? What was it worth trying? Is it something you want to try without putting pressure on? Um, again, this uh, idea that uh, there was queries about was vaping a cheaper option, um, and the difficulties in going cold turkey. So what we want to do is say, is there any benefit in us funding through um, a replacement product, um, a quitting attempt? We give out regularly hundreds of pounds in vouchers to people. If a hundred pounds pays for a quit attempt, but and actually even reduces smoking consumption, that will save far more money than the hundred pounds spent in supermarket vouchers over say three weeks, because it could make a change which will last over weeks and months. So we are quite happy to think about how we spend our money differently to support this, rather than just always responding to crisis. I guess the final one I wanted to raise is, um, and it's always really sad when we see that landlords aren't seen as a source of support. I know many, many social housing providers invest hugely. I mean, we invest as a business 10 to 15 million pounds a year in our charitable foundation to support our residents. Um, we find actually the relationship with us builds trust in the landlord uh, because it's a very person centred sort of support. Um, we're not talking about smoke free tenancies, we're talking about that individual and their needs and their household. Um, so I would hope to see if, if, as we progress work in this area, that it would increase all of our other money guidance services tend to increase trust in a landlord. And I would hope that as we extend into smoking cessation, this will do similarly. Um, I think there's a, probably my main points, Deborah. Um, yeah, more no, than happy you. to answer any questions, but I think that's um, about the amount. I'm, uh, this has been fascinating so far, and I've been a poor chair in not keeping people to time. Um, can I kick off with a question that sort of comes out of what people have been saying, which is, um, as Francis said, you know, what we're finding is what we've always found, which is that people think cold turkey is best, um, smoking helps their mental health, and that they resist working in groups. Francis, have you got any solutions on that that would help um, people like Liz working to develop these um, uh, these interactions? Um, well, I think I think I, I mean I, I'm I'm very keen on 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 trying to reach people in groups. So um, to actually suggest you know workplace quits or a group or family quits or um, community group quits and kind of use or, or things where you know where there's already a group in existence. Like I mentioned, the young mum. Well, social housing I think is the key example because and I wonder Liz whether there's ways that you can build on that because we certainly know that uh, group quits are more effective, but also that a lot of times people resist group quits so it's a way of building it into the community so is is that something you've done on financial advice Liz? So interestingly we find money on its own is not done well in group settings I come from a background of delivering financial capability in groups I used to do that for citizens advice but actually it has no more than surface level impact to actually help people make changes you have to work with them one-to-one -one because their money situation is so unique all of that said, what we're also looking at alongside, so when we're building smoking cessation, it is about a one on one relationship between one of our officers and a household. However, alongside this, we recognise this is just part of a wider platform of interventions we want to trial. We're going to also develop hopefully a, a place based solution, working with our communities team who are very experienced at working in groups, in communities where people meet and where they're comfortable. So interestingly, that Deborah, if you like, is on our, our horizon to that's trial really an interesting. And I know you're evaluating approach. your yeah. approaches, so um, hopefully you'll be evaluating that too, because I think that yes. will be very interesting. Yeah. Um, another point raised by Jim O'Rourke from Scotland, which I think is is very pertinent, is about uh, whether there's a resistance to raising smoking um, in housing amongst your colleagues. 
um, in the financial advice because it might affect their relationship, which is something, you know, we, we've worked for a long time on smoking and pregnancy because that was very much the concern of midwives. Um, and it, the, the research that Sonia will present on smoking and pregnancy shows that largely uh, women accept that this is something that will be raised with them. And I think moving to that point on housing is going to be quite important too, but it is very sensitive. So I don't know if you want to say anything about that. Again, I would say my colleagues, when we began these conversations nine, 12 months ago, were a few were a little bit squeamish, but, but very quickly, once we said, no, this is a, a simple, you know, we've got the, we're using a very simple brief intervention model. So it's just a normal question to ask. It's not pushed. If you don't want to talk about smoking and push it further, it's left. But if you want to bring it into the budgeting conversation, it's on the table. So I would say that's been our first platform of work is to work with the team to say it, it needs to be normal in the same way as we would ask about mental health risk, safeguarding risk, domestic violence. You know, we have to talk about a lot of tough topics with households. We ask about them in a non-judgmental, straightforward way. People gen sen gen generally do not take offence because it's part of a bigger conversation. And it follows a period in which you've already, you know, you might be 20 minutes into the conversation before it's raised. So there's a degree of trust already built and hopefully a rapport. We don't just, it's not a blunt instrument we want to use it as. Um, and Alison Powell talks about what their local stop smoking services offer. I don't know where, how far you've got down the line of, of developing that, that model, but um, this this sounds something useful and I know other stop smoking services have done the same. So Alison, um, perhaps you can put in the chat which stop smoking service you, you're you from as well. Um, and um, yes, I mean, um, Louise Ross has talked about the NCSCT training modules and they're certainly worth looking at if people haven't seen them. But I think the um, the the issue of how we actually connect more effectively. Um, and I completely agree, Francis, that this idea of hardened smokers or smokers that are hard to reach, you know, we know where smokers are and we should go to them where they are. And I think we do recognise that now, but we're still facing some of the same difficulties about where people's resistance lies and we need to do more um, to, to, to deal with that. Um, so um, I'm trying to see if we've got any other questions in the chat. Um, uh, Deborah, while you're looking, can I just say, I think Liz made a really good point about um, uh, reaching people when a key life moments like losing a job. Because I think that, that my, I take a, like a life course approach to smoking cessation, but I found that in practice people, people quit and also relapse at, at kind of key moments in their life, either kind of bad moments like where they relapse with stressful events and breakups or good moments like the birth of a baby or a new partner or a new house or something. So if we can kind of be aware of those key moments and intervene then, that's really important, I think. Well, and I'll ask Sonia to come in then bec there because actually we did talk to someone asked, did we talk to um, uh, people who'd quit successfully and people who'd relapsed? And we did. And do you want to add to what Francis was saying on that and, and Liz? Well, I, th I think that, um, you know, one of the things that's 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 come out um, t today is, is how individual people are, how, how individual people are. Um, and, you know, the, the quitters that we spoke to, um, Yes, sometimes it was a specific event. You know, we we talked to people. It was, um, you know, I wanted to be quit by the time I was 50. I wanted to be quit when I'm, I wanted to quit because I was moving in with my new partner, um, you know, and so that was a good opportunity. But but yes, you're exactly right that the, the causes for relapse are often the very same things, you know, from, um, you know, I split up with my partner and I couldn't cope. And, you know, I went back to my best friend, which was the cigarette or, you know, I was just out and, you know, everybody else was outside having a cigarette, you know, so I didn't want to be excluded. I didn't want to miss out. So I went out there and I just had one and then I had five, you know, those sorts of things. And, and yeah. It, 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 it's interesting that the, the, the things people um, fear about the, the quit attempt are often the same things that make them relapse in the end. They, you know, from the, you know, I, I fear putting on weight. I did put it, put on weight. So I, I made the conscious decision to start smoking again because I'd rather be a smoker than fat. You know, I remember what one goes. So, so yes, I, th I think the moments, um, 
the, the moments that prompt quitting are often, you know, similar to those that, that, that prompt, prompt relapsing. Alcohol's often very involved as well. Yes, I think the whole intersectionality which you pointed to is, is really important and, you know, the importance of mental health. And that's the other area where we need to do a lot more in, in explaining to people in ways that are meaningful to them, the value of quitting to mental health and also the, the, the harm that smoking does in actually engendering mental health problems and starting them off. Um, we've run over time. Uh, yet again, it's, a, it's been a fantastic session, I certainly think, and I hope everyone else has, does too. We will be sending an evaluation um, uh, survey around and please do answer it. Um, we're always looking for ways to improve our sessions. And just to remind you, the next session is Tuesday, the 4th of October on attitudes, behaviours and perceptions of support for quitting in pregnant smokers. And then on the 18th of October, both of these are 10 to 11, attitudes towards smoking support in healthcare professionals. And um, I'm sure those will both be very interesting too. I know from seeing um, Sonia's full presentation um, and the full presentation of the results of the qualitative research will be going up online. We're doing, just doing some final checks. So thank you all very much for attending and um, Ash looks forward to seeing you again at the next session. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.